If you believe what you hear in the news today, you'd be forgiven to think that, uh, in fact, the less advanced countries are a gigantic burden on the more advanced part of the world. We're told that the era of imperialism and colonialism is over. And uh, in fact, what's happening is that the West or the advanced capitalist countries are sending aid to develop the less advanced uh, countries. But if you just uh, scratch a little bit on the surface, you'll find that, that the reality is quite different. According to official figures alone from 2012, we see that the less advanced countries in the world received a total of $1.3 trillion in aid and investments and so on coming from the West. But in the same period, $3.3 trillion flowed out of uh, the less advanced countries. So far from the, the, the advanced part of the world uh, financing and supporting uh, the poor countries, it's the poor countries which are financing and supporting uh, the, the, the rich, in fact. And for every $1 of aid that is sent to the, to the poor countries, $24 are, are pulled out. Uh, and of course, this is just the official figures. But this is a source of in, in, immense inequality. Um, seven countries, United States, Japan, Germany, the UK, France, and Australia, uh, Australia and Canada, which comprise about 13% of the world's population, they hold 45% of the income in the world. And that's income according to purchasing power parity, which is actually a really bad way of, 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 of calculating income. The real figure is much higher than 45%. And meanwhile, 45% of the uh, world's population living in some of the poorest areas only gain about 9% of the income uh, throughout the world. Now, it's been 50 years since, since we first put a man on the moon. And since then, science and technology has reached amazing new heights. You have unmanned vehicles and airplanes. You have automation in, in, in te and technology reaching new heights. It means that all of the major problems of humanity can be, can be solved. And yet, for the vast majority of the world's population, things such as roads, running water, electricity, housing, uh, and, and so on, is not, is not a given. Not to even talk about three meals a day. Uh, education and healthcare, these, these things which are just the basics, uh, basic uh, uh, foundations of having a, a, a life, an ordinary life, and, and to survive, are seen as luxuries in these uh, countries. And under capitalism, they're, they're left alone to, to, to rot away in a state of backwardness and uh, barbarism and ignorance. Now, the, the crisis of the ex-colonial countries, or, or the poor countries, show really the impasse of capitalism as a whole. It's a system that's not even capable of carrying out the most basic tasks which are posed, uh, posed to it. In fact, the ruling classes, in particular the ruling class of the most advanced countries, depend on this backwardness and on, on this inequality. And the exploitation of these billions of people, uh, of poor people, and the super profits which are extract, extracted through that uh, exploitation, forms a fundamental pillar of modern capitalist society today. Now, the argument is always put forward that imperialism, or Western intervention, as it also is called sometimes, uh, uh, or, or, or aid, or whatever <laughs> they call it, brings civilization to the backward nations. And this is an idea which has been spread throughout the media, the education system, and all of the main means of propaganda of the ruling class, that you know, what was once called the white man's burden, that's what the British called it when they colonized the world, but today, you know, they talk about Africa as a, 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 an area where, where tribalism is chronic uh, and people are just good for playing drums. In the Arab world, people are backward and just uh, only talk about, only think about religious uh, extrem extremism. And uh, they have a certain quality that makes them need a strong leader and a strong man. And that's why you have all these uh, dictatorships and so on and so on. Uh, and, and they claim that the intervention of the rich countries in these areas uh, helped uh, are civilizing and democratizing them, bringing them uh, out of barbarism. But th that argument doesn't hold in reality. Uh, if we look at the Middle East, for example, now, just the, uh, the Ottoman Empire, which is obviously a long time ago, but the Ottoman Empire was almost throughout its existence an extremely rotten uh, uh, entity 
uh, extremely backward, extremely barbaric, and based on pre-capitalist forms of, of, uh, of society. But the empire was still kept alive by British imperialism for centuries as a means of, uh, of uh, you know, holding back the expansion of other European imperialist countries, basically. And the British fought every single attempt at modernizing and developing Ottoman society and removing the pre-capitalist relationships which, uh, which existed there. And even after the empire collapsed in, uh, after World War I, the Brits supported the, the Ottoman Sultan against the Turkish bourgeois revolution, the, the, the Kemalist, the, the, the movement of um, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, who led a revolution for, for, for basically for modernizing Turkey and being, bringing it into a, the, the modern era. But the Brits supported the, 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 the Sultan. And when the Sultan had used up all of his means and didn't really have anything, le le any leg to stand on anymore, they even supported him uh, as he reached out to the tribes and to the clergy, the former clergies and, and, and uh, officials of the Ottoman Empire by issuing a fatwa, which was, we can say, the first act of modern Islamic uh, uh, political Islam. And this was carried out with the support of British imperialism in a fight against uh, a democratic revolution, a national revolution led by the, by the Kemalists. Now, the Sultan was was unsuccessful. Uh, he was overthrown by, by Atatürk. And then the British swung over to support the Kurdish movement, but not the, the nationalist Kurds, the, the bourgeois uh, nationalist Kurds, or the, the democratic Kurds, but the, uh, the, the, the tribal chiefs and the clans and the traditional institutions in the Kurdish areas uh, to form a, a, a resistance movement or, a, or an army to fight against Atatürk in order to re-establish a caliphate. And again, that was the British who were supporting this. Whereas the masses, the, the millions of ma uh, masses in what's called Turkey today were fighting for emancipation from these institutions. It was the imperialists, uh, uh, the most modern capitalist power in the world, which was supporting the most backward pre-capitalist relations which existed in this area. Of course, later on, they dumped the Kurds, as they would do many, many times after that, and made a deal with Atatürk, but that was only in order to stop the, the, the expansion of uh, the, the influence of the Russian Revolution, in fact, which was having reverberations throughout the world and, and in the Middle East. And this is the, 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 the point, that capitalism in its initial stages came on the stage fighting against backwardness and obscurantism. But as it develops, it becomes itself the biggest fetter for development. And in imperialism, it rests on all that is rotten and, and, and decaying in society. It destroys the livelihood of, of the peasantry. It sabotages any attempt at modernizing society. And we see in reality the complete impasse of the system at a 10 times strength in, in the colonial world and the ex-colonial world. Now, in its ascendancy, capitalism, as I said, played a very, very progressive role. It came to power sweeping, especially in Europe, where it came to power first, it swept away this, this very complex web of classes uh, in, in feudal society, which formed an extremely conservative force holding back society. It destroyed the previous land relations. It freed the peasantry. It crushed the landlord class. It united whole nations, and for the first time destroyed the feudal um, particularism, which was there wasn't any such thing as a nation before capitalism. It was, it was people were more connected to their own village or town or immediate uh, region. But the capitalists united whole nations, uh, uh, and, and this was an enormous step forward for, for, for humanity. And along with free competition, uh, these things laid the basis for the rapid development of the productive forces, as we have seen in the past few hundred years. Now, Marx also ex explained how once the system had saturated the domestic markets, it immediately starts to, is forced to go beyond it, basically, because of the internal contradiction between the capitalists themselves. And it creates a world in its own image. Um, and Lenin explained how this process in, in the, uh, the, the, the period of imperialism, which is the highest stage of, of capitalism, is transformed. Uh, and all of the progressive traits of capitalism basically turn into their opposites. 
Instead of free competition, you have a monopoly. Instead of uh, the, the liberation of the nations, you have the uh, oppression of the, of, the, of the national liberation struggle, and so on and so on. And this period is signified by the fusion of monopoly capital and finance capital along with the state and the concentration of capital, extreme concentration of capital on a world scale and the struggle for the division and the redivision of, of, of the market, of the world markets between the main capitalist powers. Um, now, and it was this struggle and this process which was the basis for the two uh, world wars that we've seen and it's also this process which is the basis of the, of the conflicts that we see today in the Middle East um, and, and beyond. Now Lenin argued that capitalism was a necessary stage in the sorry, imperialism was a necessary stage in the development of, of, of capitalism and that it was caused by the inner contradictions of the system itself. And this theory he developed against uh, Kautsky, who was the main theoretician of the, of the Second International, who believed that imperialism was basically a political choice, that it was, uh, it was possible to reform imperialism, and that imperialist wars and bloodshed and violence wasn't uh, necessary, but a political choice. And he suggested that uh, there was a possibility of reaching a stage of ultra-imperialism uh, where every, all power is basically connected in one ma massive trust and there is basically a harmonious development, a peaceful development of capitalism uh, at this stage without the inequalities and the, uh, the contradictions that we see on a world scale today. Uh, this is an idea which is also echoed today when we see like, a lot of left people appealing to the UN or to bourgeois democracy, or to human rights you know, when, they, when they oppose imperialist wars such as uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, or the interventions in Syria and so on. But what these people really mean is, uh, what they really are saying is that a peaceful capitalism is possible. A peaceful imperialism is possible. Uh, and in reality what they're doing is that they are rallying behind their own ruling classes of, that, of, of each of their particular countries uh, and instead of in exposing the interests of the ruling classes in, in the oppressor uh, nations, they, uh, they try to justify it, but say, look, it's okay to go and dominate the world, it's okay to intervene and, and dominate other markets, but do it in a nicer way. And they basically try to sell the basic premise of, of, uh, of imperialism, which is the need to expand these markets, but try to sell it and patch it up and uh, only criticize the sy symptomatic uh, parts of it while accepting uh, de facto the essence of it. Um, so in reality they call for a more humane imperialism with, with less blood uh, and less killing. And here we see the, the second role, besides the, the, the purely economic role that imperialism plays, for the, the, the ruling class. Now Lenin quotes a very nice quote from, uh, a very good quote from, by, by Cecil Rhodes, who's a f famous British capitalist and colonialist. And uh, Rose was, was reported to say, I'm going to read out the whole quote. He says, I, I was in the east end of London, a working class quarter yesterday, and attended a meeting of the unemployed. I listened to the wild speeches, which were just a cry for bread and bread. And on my way home, I pondered over this scene, and I became more than ever convinced of the importance of imperialism. My cherished idea is a solution for the social problem, i.e., in order to save the 40 million inhabitants of the United Kingdom from its bloody civil war, we colonial statesmen must acquire new lands to settle the surplus population, to provide new markets for the goods pr produced in the factories and mines. And the empire, as I've always said, is a bread and butter question. If you want to avoid civil war, you must become imperialists. Now, this shows how the, the, the bourgeois basically use the super profits achieved from the oppressed nations to buy social peace at home, in particular at the tops of the, of the labor movement. And it's this pri privileged position which ties the labor, labor leaders and uh, the labor bureaucracy to the ruling class uh, uh, and makes them basically a, how do you say, uh, 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 agent of the ruling class into the, into the working class movement. Um, and at the same time, it also gives an av avenue to permeate society in racist ideas, which is, uh, on the one hand, uh, you know, the, 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 the racist propaganda that we hear is, on the one hand, a need 
from, from by the bourgeois to justify the imperialism, to justify their plunder and, and, and bloodshed and so on. But at the same time, it's equally an attempt at using imperialism as a political tool to galvanize reaction and counter-revolution at home by, by whip, whipping up nationalism and uh, 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 imperialist chauvinism. Now Marx wrote about the question of Ireland. He said, he explained this process, he said, for a long time I believed that it was possible to overthrow the Irish regime uh, by English working class ascendancy. But deeper study has shown, has now convinced me of the opposite. The English working class will never achieve anything unless it has got rid of Ireland. It, the English reaction in England had its roots in the subjugation of Ireland. So here we see that the, the key role of imperialism, uh, uh, maybe even um, in some ways more important than, than the purely economic role uh, of imperialism for the, for the ruling class, is to allow it to divide the working class on an international scale, uh, whip up nationalism, and, and, and rally the, uh, the, the, the working class behind themselves. And therefore, the serious struggle against capitalism can only be uh, uh, take place at the same time as a serious struggle against uh, imperialism. Capitalism is international, and so is the working class. And a defeat for the imperialism abroad is equally a defeat for, the, uh, for reaction uh, and the ruling class at home, and vice versa. Um, and, the, and the struggle of the oppressed nations is therefore also, at the same time, the, the struggle of the workers in the imperialist countries. Uh, and this also means that the workers in the imperialist countries have an extra duty in being extra <laughs> uncompromising in the stance against uh, imperialism, against their own ruling classes, in order to bridge this enormous mistrust that the, that the nationalism and the imperialist plunder has, uh, has imbued into the, uh, the, 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 the uh, colonial and ex-colonial world, into the oppressed nations, and by that, by that to forge the strongest possible working class unity on an international uh, scale. Now, in the oppressed nations, the bourgeoisie, uh, the, the, the bourgeoisie of the oppressed nations is not capable of carrying out the most basic tasks of, of the bourgeois revolution. It becomes they, because they came onto the stage of history far too late and were far too weak in relation to the, um, to the major uh, capitalist powers to, uh, to, 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 to play a role. That means that the land question, the removal of the pre-capitalist relations, industrialization, bourgeois democracy, national liberation, all of these things is not capable of carrying out. And insofar as these tasks are, are carried out in the, uh, uh, the, the oppressed nations, it's, it's only ever done as a concession to the revolutionary movements which threaten to go beyond the, uh, the, the, the capitalism. For example, in Turkey, where the British had to give concessions to the Ataturk uh, regime because they were afraid of the spread of Bolshevism, uh, ba basically. And even then, this is only carried out in an incomplete manner. Uh, and, and we see here that it's imperialism and capitalism itself that becomes uh, the problem. And the only solution is to go beyond the system and overthrow the system uh, as a whole. And that defines the main tasks of the communists of revolutionaries of the opp oppressed nations, which stand in front of a very complicated task. Extra complicated because the class composition in the oppressed nations are quite complex. Because on the one, on the one hand, you have the modern bourgeoisie, the modern working class, which has been more or less built up by the intervention of, of, of the imperialists and, and by the spread of capitalism. But at the same time, you have the tribes, the nobles, the landlords, the clergy, peasant communities, uh, even nomads, and, and, so, and so on, which are from, from pre-capitalist uh, uh, periods, but as I explained, uh, remain there because of the effects that are, are, are of imperialism. Throughout the Middle East and, and Africa, you see lots of people living, millions of people living in, in tribal societies, and even some people, uh, as I said, as, as, as nomads. Tribal links in countries such as in the Arab Peninsula plays a huge role, in fact, there's a couple of tribes who, who have power in this area. In Iraq, Jordan, Syria, Sudan, uh, and, and many other places, tribes still play a huge role, and millions of people live in, in tribal societies. And meanwhile, the working classes are relatively small compared to the rest of society. 
Um, at the same time, having an extremely oppressive, a, a massive imperialist uh, power can overshadow and blur the class contradictions within the oppressed uh, nation itself. Now, for example, in, in, uh, in Egypt in 1919, there was a massive uh, revolutionary movement. Uh, now, this was a country at that time which more than 100 years had been oppressed by the arbitrary rule of, of the British and the Ottomans. And during World War I, the British drafted one and a half million Egyptians into the labor corp. Uh, they, they also arbitrarily seized crops, agricultural land, properties, basically did whatever they could, whatever they, uh, they, they, they wanted to in order to support the British war effort and to buy social stability at home in Britain as well. And at the same time, they, they brutally oppressed uh, any kind of opposition coming from, from Egypt. But in exchange, there was kind of a, a promise dangled in front of the Egyptians that after the war, they would be given some form of, uh, of independence. But of course, after the war, as it happened to all, uh, most, more, more or less all of the other uh, oppressed nations, none of them were given independence. They weren't even invited to the uh, negotiations. Um, and uh, this, this led to enormous anger uh, within society. Now, the main opposition party, the only real party existing at that time in Egypt was, was the Waft Party, which was a liberal party composed of the upper layers of the, of the middle classes and, and the bourgeois, the, the, the domestic bourgeois uh, and the landlord class. Um, and they started, typical of a middle class organization, they started a petitioning campaign to collect signatures for basically in support of, uh, of independence. Now, little did they know, this would become the, the, the spark of a mass revolutionary movement, millions of people taking to the street, fighting with the British, going on strike. And the, the, the revolution basically ended with, the, uh, the, with Britain uh, uh, giving formal independence to, to, to Egypt and, and also making a deal with the Waft Party basically to come to power. But the Waft Party it was itself a party of bourgeois which was directly connected on the one hand to the imperialists themselves and to the landowners and to, and to the landlords. They had no interest in changing the actual setup. And the deal that they made with the, with the British was basically that the, the British remained, uh, have, had bases th uh, throughout Egypt. They maintained control of all the main uh, state institutions, in the most important state institutions, as well as the main parts of the, of the economy. Essentially, uh, nothing changed. Um, and this, the, 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 the actions of the Waf Party and the Waf Party itself embodies the colonial bourgeois uh, the democracy. That as long as there is this uh, imperialist uh, uh, oppression, they can kind of hide behind that because it, it blurs the class contradictions uh, in, in society between them and the workers and the poor peasants. And they can rally the whole nation behind them. Um, but at the same time, being tied to landlordism and imperialism themselves have no interest at abolishing any of these things. But what they really want is to sit, they want a place at the table uh, 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 along with the big bourgeois. Um, now, meanwhile, the largest class by far in Egypt was the, was the impoverished peasantry, which lived in extremely backward and, uh, and desperate conditions. And its main demand was uh, land distribution which is something that at, at once would have wiped away all of landlordism and all these pre-capital layers I, 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 in Egypt. And it would lay the basis for an actual bourgeois, bourgeois democratic revolution um, and, 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 and modernize Egypt basically from the, from the ground up. But the peasantry by its own nature, because it's atomized, it's competing against each other, living at far distances, does, can never play, and also being uh, dominated by the, by the cities, can never play an independent political role. It always ra rallies behind one of the major urban uh, classes. Now, this, would, this inevit inevitably means that uh, it would either have to follow, the, 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 the revolution would be decided by which way the peasantry swung, either behind the, the uh, bourgeoisie and the urban petty bourgeois, or behind the working class. And therefore, the main struggle became the struggle between the working class in the cities and the, 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 the bourgeoisie uh, there. Um, da -da 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 -da. And this is the main task throughout uh, 
the, the, the oppressed nations and in the colonial and ex-colonial world, even to this day, that the essential struggle comes down to the, the proletariat fighting to win over the leadership of the, uh, of the, uh, of the, of the peasantry and, all, and of all the middle layers. And in doing so, having the duty to expose the, class, the, the differences in the interests of those classes, explain to the peasants that these people have no interest in actually carrying out uh, the, 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 the revolution that you uh, want that the working class led by, led by the communists must expose this illusion of national unity which exists and break the movement on class lines. And that's the only way they can carry out the revolution of the peasantry. That's the only way they can carry out the bourgeois democratic tasks of the oppressed nations. But here, just like in the Russian Revolution, which is, which is exactly the same process, it cannot, the, the working class cannot stop at bourgeois democratic tasks. They cannot stop just, just by uh, expropriating the land laws and introducing formal bourgeois democracy, it needs to continue to overthrow capitalism itself and implement a dictatorship of the proletariat, which means what? A, a Soviet state and a planned economy. Uh, on a capitalist basis, independence in itself cannot solve any of the problems facing uh, the masses. And this was brilliantly summed up by, by James Colony, Connolly, he was saying to the Irish revolutionaries, he said, if you remove the English army tomorrow and hoist the green flag over Dublin, uh, Dublin Castle, unless you set about the organization of the social republic, your efforts would be in vain. England would still rule you. She would rule you through her capitalists, through her landlords, through her financiers, through the whole array of commercial and individual institutions she's planted in this country and watered with the tears of our mothers and the blood of our martyrs. And in the post-war period, we saw a whole wave of uh, revolutions uh, erupting in the ex-colonial world. Billions of formerly stagnant layers who uh, were brought to political life by, by being mobilized into the imperialist armies, by the shocks of war, and also seeing an opportunity in the decline of British uh, imperialism, uh, came to the fore in one revolution uh, uh, after another. And in these conditions, U.S. imperialism, which was, which was the rising power at that, at that point, understood that direct colonial rule was no lo longer a viable uh, option. Uh, but where these movement, movements stopped short of overthrowing capitalism, such as in Zimbabwe, in Argentina, or even in Egypt, um, the U.S. used the financial and industrial power it had and it leaned on the local elites to create a sort of a, a, a comprador bourgeoisie, a comprador capitalist class, backed by U.S. finance capital, and this kind of uh, and rule through these. And this indirect rule uh, actually proved to be far more profitable and uh, stable uh, for for U.S. imperialism because governments could come and go, but they would still uh, dominate as long as the main capitalist main pillars of capitalism main, uh, remained. The U.S. could still dominate the country. And fundamentally, the relationship didn't, didn't um, change. And we can see here that on a purely capitalist basis, national liberation cannot be achieved. Now, after World War II, the colonies were bursting with revolutionary anger. The authority of the, of the, of the Soviet Union reached new highs because of the defeats, uh, uh, the victory of the, of the Red Army over, over Hitler. And this led to, to the rise of a huge uh, leftist and socialist movement throughout the colonial world, and, uh, and especially in the Middle East. Um, in Egypt, the betrayal of 1919 revolution radicalized society. The vast majority of workers and intellectuals moved sharply to the left towards Marxism and communism. Unfortunately, this didn't materialize in a communist party because of the, the, the mistakes of the, of the Comintern. Nevertheless, mass protests uh, started to mount. And in 1952, not having found an expression through a, a revolutionary party, this was expressed uh, by a coup uh, led by, uh, carried out by a group called the Free Officers Movement in Egypt, led by Gamal Abdel Nasser, who overthrew the old uh, Farouk uh, monarchy. Now, the, the Free Officers were uh, kind of a how do you say, a mosaic of type, very different types of people, but they were basically nationalists, and they, did, they weren't socialists, they weren't leftists when they came to power, at least not, uh, not, not that much. Uh, obviously, they would have been affected by these ideas. 
But they were, on the one hand, they were better educated than most of, uh, most of the Egyptians. In their positions, relatively high up in the state, they had direct access, on the one hand, to European countries and uh, to, the, to the more modern parts of the world. And at the same time, they could see the enormous incompetence of the colonial rule and of the, of the, of the ruling elite in, in Egypt. Um, and they wanted to restore Egypt's honor, basically. That's, I think that's a basic uh, kind of impulse they had to their acts. They wanted to restore Egypt's honor and free it from backwardness and, and colonial uh, oppression. But after seizing power, at each stage, every time they try to carry out anything, I mean, we don't have time to go into the details and the nuances of this, but every, at each stage, they faced the, the, the brutal oppression of, of, of the imperialist powers. In 1956, uh, Nasser wanted to build the Aswan Dam, which would be an enormous source of electricity and for the, for the modernization, a uh, very important uh, uh, element for the modernization of, of, of Egypt. But, the, but Britain and the US pulled uh, the credit line for Egypt and basically uh, bankrupted the project. So Nasser instead said, okay, well, if that's the case, then we're going to nationalize the Suez Canal, which is built by, by Egyptians, run by Egyptians, and only the profits are going to, 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 the, to, to the British. And this was an enormously powerful uh, signal which sent reverberations throughout the world. And, uh, and Nasser was met with, uh, with, with enormous enthusiasm by mass revolutionaries, movements uh, everywhere, especially in the Middle East, but, but everywhere in the world. And he would, he would do this uh, continuously in the next period, leaning on the mass movement to, to strike blows against the bourgeois and against the imperialism, nationalizing many companies and building a national industry, uh, in effect, for, for Egypt. In fact, at one point, it's reported that he asked Stalin if he should just expropriate the whole, or abolish capitalism as a whole. But Stalin said, no, it's better just to wait. You know, this <laughs> we don't want to disrupt things too much. <laughs> Uh, anyway, he, he didn't do that in the end. He didn't abolish capitalism. Uh, and, but the similar process and similar movements took place many where. In, in Syria, it was a place where in the Middle East the process went the furthest. There you had a series of coups where, in effect, expropriated the bourgeoisie. And you had a, a, a system such, similar to the Soviet Union with a nationalized planned economy, but run by a very tight uh, uh, dictatorship. Um, and again, you had in Afghanistan, Ethiopia, China, and many other places, uh, these movements moving towards socialism, in effect. Now, this was, a, this was a reflection of the conditions in the world, because on the one hand, you had the revolution in the West being delayed by the betrayals of the, by the Stalinists and the social democ demo uh, democrats, and at the same time, you had an overripe uh, colonial uh, revolution which in the absence of a, of a leadership by the working class was forced nevertheless to go down the, the, the path of a workers' revolution. Because this task, the, task of, of the basic task of modernizing society essentially, a bourgeois democracy, could not be solved under capitalism. And the results speak for themselves. If you go to Egypt today, you can say whatever you want about Nasser, he was in effect a dictator. But if you go to Egypt today, Basically, nothing has been built since the time of Nasser. You just look at the, 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 the trains, the factories, the infra basic infrastructure of Egyptian society was built uh, during the time of, uh, of Nasser. Or, if you, or if Syria, before the civil war, was by far the most advanced country in the Middle East. It was true that it was actually opening up, going the Chinese way, opening up to capitalism and so on. But the planned economy actually allowed Syrian society to get rid of un unemployment and um, give healthcare, free education, uh, and, and a relatively, compared with the rest of the region, good living standard uh, for, for the majority of, of the population. Um, all living layers in society were actually moving to the left, moving towards socialism. Uh, also, obviously, encouraged and impelled by, by, the, by the example of the Soviet Union. Now in Egypt, uh, this, this also left fewer and fewer layers for the imperialists to lean on. Uh, and in Egypt, the only uh, movement that they kind of could find was the Muslim Brotherhood, which became the main opposition movement to the Nasserist movement. Now the Muslim Brotherhood was based around a layer of urban middle classes, uh, such as lower state employees, like teachers and so on, the lowest layers of, of, of state bureaucracy, 
which was recruited from the bankrupted uh, middle uh, landowner class, which enjoyed relative stability for, for many, many centuries. But with the rise of imperialism and capitalism, their position became completely untenable. They were verging on bankruptcy, and many of them had to move into the cities or face just going completely bankrupt in the villages. And in the cities, because they weren't the big landlords, they didn't have access to higher layers of the state. They could only come into the, the bottom layers. There, there was a ceiling above which they couldn't go over. Uh, and being, you know, coming from this privileged position, in effect, from the villages, where they were someone, where people would come and ask them advice and, and, and so on, they saw their position collapse. They hated the imperialists. They were jealous of the big landlords and the national bourgeois, but at the same time, they felt threatened by the rising working class movement, the ideas of, of, of the Bolshevik revolution, which all threatened its own insignificant, uh, traditionally based uh, privileges. And they concluded that the, the, the struggle was, in effect, a cultural struggle between the, the imperialist, uh, the, the European based modernizers, and then this was the imperialists as well as the communists. Uh, and at the same time, the domestic Islamic culture, which was being colonized. Um, in the beginning, these, these layers were a part of Nasser's movement. But as Nasser swung to the left, and also he was very, you know, he didn't want to really share power with anyone. He was very brutal. Um, their classes intensified. And um, they found that in the Islamic movement, which was kind of left over from the, from the Ottoman Empire, they found a way out. They formed a type of revivalist movement, which called for a return to an era uh, of, of re-establishing the privileges of the middle class and re-establishing the traditions and so on, which, which would basically give them their old position back. And in every way, you can say, in every sense of the word, this movement was a, was a reactionary movement. And for this exact reason, the imperialists, US imperialism, could lean on these and began to develop them as a key ally in the region. Um, and along with the Wahhabi movement in, in Saudi Arabia, which was, uh, which was similar, although it developed differently, uh, they used this Islamic fundamentalism as the most efficient tool to organize and to galvanize all these backward layers, the tribal layers, the landlords, all the pre-capitalist layers in society, which all had a, saw a danger in a revolution and in, 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 uh, in, in communism. In Afghanistan, they had the first success with the rise of the, of the, of the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, um, uh, 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 which, which fought against the so pro-Soviet regime. But this use of these, uh, these kind of movements have continued, as we can see, uh, right up until today. Um, now, supposedly, Islamic fundamentalists are against US imperialism. But the fact is that as a, as a movement, as a mass, mass movement, they could never survive a single day without uh, the, US, the support of U.S. Uh, imperialism. So when they talk about bringing democracy to the Arab world and civilization to the Arab world, we have to remember that, in fact, Western imperialism is the biggest backer of all that is backward and all that is barbaric uh, throughout uh, the Middle East. Now, the crisis in the colonial countries reveals the complete dead end and the rottenness of, of, of capitalism. And all of the barbarism and cruelty of capitalism is really uh, at its full display here. And so it's not surprising that a lot of young people who, uh, are beginning, you know, waking up to political life and seeing this injustice, they are attracted to these ideas such as post-colonialism, uh, which, uh, which is very prevalent in, in universities and in academia today. But in, in our opinion, from a Marxist point of view, there's nothing progressive about the ideas of, of post-colonialism, which is why, in fact, they are so prevalent in academia, which is why they are pushed in every single university as the main and dominant political theory today. Because while it's true that the post-colonials uh, you know, point out imperialism and racism and, and the oppression that the, that the rich countries carry out and have carried out, uh, although they don't point out all of that, that oppression, but they don't link this with the class nature of Western capitalism. Instead, they blame uh, imperialism on, on Western culture. And in doing so, they lump the workers and the, the, the capitalists into the same category. Um, and for them, Marxism is an equally reactionary ideology or movement as that of imperialism because it's Eurocentric, because it's 
is imposing the European imperialist uh, culture. As you can see, this is very similar, in fact, parallel to what the Islamic movement in Egypt started uh, as. And basically, they claim that the national background, uh, your national background, or your cultural background, define how correct your ideas are. Uh, obviously, when you put it like that, everyone can see that it's, it's, it's pure uh, nonsense. And instead of um, arguing for international working class unity against imperialism, they fight uh, for, they, they struggle for increased representation of oppressed nations in the state and educational institutions and so on. Essentially, this is nothing but identity politics, which is the same as nationalism uh, the, the, in, in the oppressed nationalism, but not the, the revolutionary nationalism of the masses, but the counter-revolutionary nationalism of the middle classes in those areas. Now, these, the people the, the, you know, uh, coming up with these theories, they like to portray themselves as very, very radical, but they only highlight the symptoms of imperialism, and even, on, and even then only some of these symptoms, and never really pose any real threat to the system as a whole, never pose a criticism of the essence of the system uh, of, of, of class oppression of one class after another on an international scale. Now, South Africa, I think, is the greatest example, or a, at least a great example, because there are many, of a res result of this type of policy, of the final conclusion of what this, uh, this leads to. Here you have, in South Africa, a liberation movement, the African Nation Congress, coming to power on the basis of a revolution in the early 90s. But then the ANC betrays the masses, who are actually fighting for socialism. They, 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 they agree with the ruling class not to abolish capitalism. Um, and, but they, nevertheless, they take over the state apparatus in South Africa. They put black South Africans throughout the state apparatus, through universities, schools, media, all the way to the top, to the presidential post. They even introduced something called black economic empowerment, which is a program which means that it's basically creating business opportunities for black people. So all the big companies have to have a certain representation of black South Africans in their boards. Um, and through this, you have a layer of people, including Cyril Ramaphosa, who is now the president of South Africa, uh, and who was the former the leader of the Mine Workers Union, a very powerful movement with hundreds of thousands of, of, of people, supposedly a revolutionary and, and the socialist. And he amasses huge amounts of wealth by being on the boards of these mines and, and, and different companies through the BE, through this, uh, well, increased representation, uh, so to say. And you have in 2012, where the workers of Lonmen and Marikana go on strike, on peaceful strike, demanding higher wages, that Sili Ramaphosa is on the other side of the barricade, so, uh, and, and along with the, other, the rest of the capitalist class, the state and the police, they carry out a massacre which kills dozens of, uh, uh, of workers and, and wounds hundreds more. I.e. the exact same methods that the apartheid regime used to oppress the, 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 the black South Africans before that and continuous exploitation of, of them. And since then, Ramaphosa has become, uh, he's also one of the richest men in South Africa, by the way, and he's become the president of the, uh, the country as well. Now, his fate is similar to a very, very, very slim layer of black South Africans, but for the vast majority of black South Africans, what's changed? Before, they didn't have access to electricity or water or housing. Well, you have access now, but the majority of people can't afford that. Uh, education and healthcare is in an extremely dire strait. Unemployment is uh, around 50 to 60 percent for, for, for am amongst the youth. And racism has by no means actually ended. You know, uh, unemployment, I think, for, for white South Africans is about six to seven percent. But as I said, for black South Africans, it's around 30 percent, 25, 30 percent, if not more. Before, you used to have small townships guarded by barbed wire uh, where black people were in there. Well, now you have small township, townships guarded by barbed wire in which white people mainly and rich people live and uh, for where the majority of the populations do not have, uh, uh, have access. The land question has not been solved. There's hundreds of thousands of extremely poor peasants living in very, very backward uh, situation. And this is... Essentially, this, but this movement nevertheless fulfills all of the aims of the, 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 the post-colonial movements, the decolonized movements, and whatever they, 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 they call them themselves.
essentially what this theory represents, I think, is the interest of the petty, of the petty bourgeoisie, which is far more afraid, in fact, of the revolution than it is of the, of the imperialists. What they want to say is, let us guard the, 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 the rest. Let us sit on the table. They want to be the Ramaphosas, or if you want, the Obamas of this world. They want to sit at the same table as the capitalists, not to overthrow them. And instead of fighting uh, for mod modernizing uh, oppressed nations and bringing them out of the backwardness, they fetishize backwardness. Uh, in India, they defend the, the caste system as a, like, this is a natural way of life. But obviously, they would never want to spend a, a single day in one of the uh, lower castes. In the Middle East, they defend religious obscurantism and political in Islam in one way or another. Um, and they, in doing all of this, they actually put themselves in the same camp as imperialism, who they, they, they claim to be criticizing, and against the revolutionary masses. Because in the past 70 year or 100 years, we've seen again and again the masses in the colonial world have, have been struggling against backwardness and against barbarism, against obscurity, against all of these things. And it's been held back by the imperialists. Uh, and on all fundamental matters, therefore, we can see that, th that, that the philosophy of, of the post-colonial uh, uh, crowd is actually parallel to the religious fundamentalist groups that we see uh, in many places uh, 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 around the world. And we have to expose this. Uh, we need to expose this everywhere and explain that, this, that the, the struggle against oppression and exploitation cannot be uh, disconnected from the struggle against capitalism as a whole. Now look at, look at Egypt today. Nasser never abolished capitalism completely, and therefore, after his death, there was a, a counter-revolution from within, from within the regime, with the help of US imperialism, uh, US finance capital, um, which basically undid all of the gains of the Egypt, Egyptian revolution and un undermined them uh, in one way or another. And in the end, fundamentally, nothing has changed. Egyptians, Egypt's independence is only in words. Um, the, e Egyptians, the Egyptian capitalism cannot appease the basic needs of Egyptian society and Egyptian masses. And the ruling class can only rely on the most brutal forms of dictatorship in order to maintain its grip uh, around, uh, on power. Of course, again, backed by imperialist uh, capital. The 2011 revolution was, a, in, in a way, a continuation of the unfinished bourgeois democratic revolution in, in Egypt. Over the course of three years, you saw five uprisings and two revolutions. A whole series of governments came and went, representing different factions of Egyptian uh, capitalism. Um, but as long as Egypt is tied to capitalism and to the world market, they couldn't do anything, and they all followed the same policy. In fact, they followed the exact same policy in that the main policy of all of these governments were to carry out the IMF packages which was, which was being negotiated in that whole period, which has finally been, been, been implemented by the CC regime. Now, the only solution to actually achieving, you know, in Egypt, a lot of people, the, the petty bourgeois were saying, no, let's just fight for democracy, and then later on we can look at all things. Yes, but why is it there's no democracy in, in Egypt? It's because capitalism cannot afford democracy in Egypt. On a capitalist basis, in the given conditions of, of, of a deep crisis of capitalism, you cannot uh, achieve uh, even bourgeois uh, uh, democracy. And the only way to, to achieve the, the, the main demands, the basic demands of the Egyptian revolution, is to expropriate, not to f support one part of the ruling class or another, but to expropriate the ruling class as a whole, and for the masses to take power into their own hands. And of course, this is not an easy thing, having done so, Immediately, uh, the, 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 a revolution, a socialist revolution in Egypt would be isolated economically. The imperialists would isolate it economically. They would send probably also military detachments one way or another to oppose it. And that just means that it's extra important, again, equally important for the revolution to expand and appeal to the international working class in the region as well as in the, uh, in the oppressed nations to form the strongest international class uh, alliance. Now, this, what we see here is that capitalism on a world scale has outplayed its role. The same parasites who per perpetuate barbarism in, in the less advanced countries carry out austerity uh, in, 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 uh, and attacks against living standards in the advanced countries. 
And the struggle for the liberation of the oppressed nations is the same as the struggle for the liberation of the working class in the oppressor nations. By overthrowing the whole system uh, on an international scale, that's the only way to achieve true uh, liberation and lay the basis for a harmonious development of society in the interests of the, of the vast majority of the population. Thanks.